So look, this is the topic that we're going to talk about today. So it's how to build that international payments business, or how to, to create an international solution that sits alongside your domestic financial service capabilities. Um, before we go into who I am, who Graham is, it's probably good idea to give you a little bit of context about Currency Cloud and what we do. Not because we're trying to sell you something, but it gives you that context and that level of understanding so you can, you can see how we see the world and how we approach certain things. So Currency Cloud, we're a B2B to X international payments organization. Now, if you take away all of that, you know, bullshit bingo and buzzwords, what that boils down to is that about 14 years ago, our founders, they recognized that in moving money from one bank account at one part of the world to another bank account in another part of the world, where there's a cross of a border and there's a cross of a currency, it's quite a complex process if you're trying to build it from the ground up. But if you're at a level of understanding, you can make it that modular and compartmentalized process so you can actually then represent it to users via an API so they can very seamlessly add this as part of their overall financial offering. So me, my name's Dave Rees. Um, I've been at Currency Cloud for just into my 12th year. I um, worn many hats in that time, from smile and dial salesperson to customer support to general firefighter and jobs worth. Um, right now, I work on our partnerships team. So you may have noticed from my accent that I'm not from around here. I'm the other side of the Atlantic. Um, and again, that's probably going to lead to, I'm not still drunk from last night. This is just what Scottish sounds like on a, on a Thursday morning. Um, Graham. Yep. So I'm Graham Hilding. I work on our solutions team, sales, pre-sales engineering effectively um, at Currency Cloud. So really work in lockstep with our new business sales team and really help craft out what it might be, what it might entail for a client from a technical angle to build to our platform, right? So really just sales enablement. Um, and also post-sales, so I really take these clients live and, you know, basically sell the dream, right? So um, you can look at my professional uh, car selfie there. So that's the, you know, best professional photo that I have. So my LinkedIn photo is not much better. I'm like 18 years old, so, yeah. Cool. Good, man. So look, what are we going to talk about today? So what the FX, what is FX, what's it about, why do we care about this as developers, as product people, as sales people, as general businesses. Um, what's the problem, what's the opportunity? So what are we trying to solve for? Because there's no point in just wrapping a bunch of trendy, trendy ideas into an API and think it's gonna sell. It has to solve a problem for the user. We're gonna walk through a few real life scenarios. So how to move money from the US to another part of the world and how to actually collect money from another part of the world and bring it back into the US. So to, to like going inbound and outbound. And then, very much, how to actually build it. So, how to utilize the APIs. How, what do they actually mean when you're actually a developer, you're an engineer, when you're a product person trying to map out the end-to-end -end process of a transaction. This one, I'll, do you want me to take another next one? Yeah. So, what is FX? So, foreign exchange is actually the biggest financial market in the world. I think it, there's a few differing sort of like um, studies on this, but as a general guesstimate, it's north of $6 trillion per day. So, it's huge. Now, the vast majority of that is going to be speculative, buying one currency and the amount they're going to appreciate and then you sell it back and make a profit. But there's still, that has a huge impact on the slightly smaller sort of like deliverable foreign exchange component where you're actually moving money from one part of the world to the other. Now, trading from one currency to another, this is almost like it's a little bit simplified, but the idea here is that this very quickly gets incredibly complex. And the reason why is because FX it very much, it, it wraps in a, a whole load of like um, buzzwords and acronyms and nomenclature that is very much designed to try and, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a more polite way than say just absolutely baffle the people who, who are trying to enter this and understand it and then be subject matter experts in other parts of the payment process. And then last not, it's very much fundamental. So it's not only really gonna be useful for you, but and again, as we're gonna see in some later slides, this is why we care about FX so passionately. So. Yeah, so three reasons why you actually should care about building this platform, right? So first reason, you can make more money, right? Second reason, you can actually save money. Um, that's pretty important. Third reason is you stay out of jail. So as Dave Reese just mentioned, right? So moving money is pretty complex around the world. So you're working with various you know, banks. Um, so there's a lot of regulatory hurdles, right? So when you think of AML compliance, all of those aspects. Um, building a cross-border solution makes you think about those things, and obviously, everybody wants to stay out of jail, so being compliant is very important. Yep, so really, that whole purpose of this cross-border solution, so 
make more money. It's an additional revenue source, right? So div diversifying your portfolio, right? Um, you differentiate from your competitors. Maybe most of the competitors in the fintech landscape, they're very domestic focused. They're not really thinking of you know, expanding or, or launching out and doing this global money movement solution. Save, save new money. So you're basically launching something new without overspending, right? So, and it's an opportunity of um, switching on you know, potential new customers as well. And then, yep, as I mentioned, staying compliant. So keep on top of that regulation and um, you know, benefit from working with the trusted provider. And no, oh, go for it. I was going to question because we're talking about why is it important for this audience, but I'm acutely aware that we've not actually asked what the people in this audience do. So, quick show of hands: how many people here are developers, engineers? That's good. Product people. Good stuff. Sleazy salesman. There it is. Um, and what else? Who's not raised their hand? Uh, lawyer. Lawyer. Beg your pardon. Good. We're friends. Partnerships is awesome. Right. So why is it important for this audience? So look, um, when we're thinking very much looking at the developer side of things, so the, the knowledge and the experience in the context of the industry is, is so fundamental to what you guys do. And I'm not you know, teaching you how to suck eggs here. This is very important. The idea here is that just being good at writing code, that's table stakes. That doesn't separate you in the market. So what we're thinking about is those guys who, who have the, the subject matter expertise of of payments and foreign exchange, who can then take that knowledge and then wrap that up into a code and then represent it to other developers so they can utilize it. That is really important. The other side of it is getting lost in a rabbit hole. As I alluded to, you know, we talk about foreign exchange, the buzzwords, so it's like sh uh, short or long or bid offer spreads or interest rate variables in a pre-spot transaction. It's all baffling. It's designed to bullshit you. So the idea is that when you strip away all that, it becomes actually something that's it's consumable so you can then understand it and then represent it. And last but not least, getting yourself empowered. I'm a, a firm believer, because I've seen it in action, it's the best people, the most valuable people at Currency Cloud, we are a tech organization. It's our developers who, our ops people, will go up and ask our developers what's happening within the SWIFT world or what's happening within the payments world, because they understand it as good, if not better, than the people who actually process the transactions on a, a platform. Gee. Yeah, so we can, with that in mind, we can actually take a look at three different approaches of how to do this, right? So we'll break these down. So the first approach is doing it yourself, right? I think this is the most complicated approach. You go out there, you establish your own bank partners, your own relationships, you build your own platform. Very time consuming, right? And we'll get into those nitty gritties. The second approach here is you buy an all-in-one solution, right? So you work with another provider, they're just giving you an out-of-the-box product, right, to go do that. Pretty easy. And then the third approach is kind of what we want to lean towards, right, is building uh, that approach with a partner, right, so bringing together the various providers that have already done this so you can go to market a lot quicker. And obviously there's, you know, pros and cons to all these approaches, and we'll highlight these here, right, so do it yourself. You're the master of your own destiny, right? You're creating that product solely for yourself. It might be time consuming, but you're in control of that, right? The prom, you know, the cons here, it's a long process, right? It's very expensive. So if you're gonna go out and do this yourself, you're talking about working with an international company, setting up bank relationships in each one of those companies, or each one of those countries, setting up your own compliance program, very, 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 Hard, right, and so obviously you have to figure out, you know, what you're doing in that market, right? Approach two, like I mentioned, so it's quick to market, right? So you go to somebody that's already built this. They give you a pre-built UI. They give you, you know, something to just get launched right away, and you just rely on that, right? The problem with purchasing this minimum viable product, it is just a minimum viable product, right? So there's no reason, there's no room to scale. You're completely reliant on that partner. And the approach three here, right? You have better control, right? So you can choose the right partners to work with, like Currency Cloud, that have that knowledge in the, in the field, um, you know, to help you build that cross-border solution. There is some 
negativities to this too, right? So there's the complexity of multiple providers that you have to rely on. So obviously Currency Cloud, we're connected into various banking partners. So you do have to weigh on that as well. But really that's our approach here and that's what we're trying to focus on, especially within this presentation on how you build that cross-border solution. It would, yes, go. Yeah, can I lock them out? Lock them out. <laughs> right. just, just before jumping to that, so it's, it's worthwhile just bearing in mind. So when you think about the approach one or approach three, um, the example I use is you, you could build your own house, but you don't make your own bricks. So it's to understand at what altitude you want to draw at and what you want to own. What I think is really important in the world and why we're advocating the approach three, certainly for cross-border, is that if I look at this, if I think of anyone consuming financial services, the vast, vast majority of us will probably only operate in our domestic currency. So Americans, I'm going to guess that 99% of all your transactions are in some way involving USD. That's it. There's not a huge need for you to access Japanese yen or South African rand or Thai baht unless you go on holiday, unless you're business doing certain aspects to it. What we're driving at is if you were to own all of the, the, the bare metal stuff of the cross-border transaction, it's very time consuming, it's very expensive, and it doesn't necessarily get that bang for your buck because you don't necessarily want to have all that. You want to focus on where your core products are and what your core market is and what your IP needs to be to you. But when it comes to actually just augmenting with an additional bit of functionality, which isn't going to get used every day, it might not even get used every week, but it's there when your customer needs it. So it makes sure it stays within your environment and you're servicing all of their financial needs. Making sense? Apart from Scott's thing, there's no other questions at all now. <laughs> and so, yeah, to Dave Reese's point here, the complexity of doing this in the US market is huge. Um, so, yeah, as Dave Reese mentioned, most fintechs today are very domestically focused. Um, and if you're going to offer a payment solution or a payment service, if you go out and do it yourself, the complexity in the US is massive. So you have to obtain what's called a money transfer license in each state. Um, and then you have to maintain each one of those license, licenses, and they're pretty hard to obtain, right? Um, so do you need to be regulated to offer a cross-border solution? In most cases, yes, right? So if you're offering a payment service, you do need to have some form of regulation. But the ways that you can do it is you can do it yourself, so you can go obtain all those MTLs, or you can do it through partnerships, right? So how we have stood up programs or fintechs within the US is through partnerships, right? They leverage us, they leverage our licenses to move money cross border, um, or they work with a domestic partner, like a banking as a service partner, program manager, a sponsor bank, right? So leveraging that can take out a lot of that complexity of obtaining your own licenses um, and getting essentially to market quicker. Perfect. So with that in mind, now we can walk through a particular scenario and really talk about how to build it, right? So really what we're going to touch on here, um, this scenario, what we're pretending is we're working with a US B2B neobank, right? That's maybe supporting startups to make international payments, whether it's vendors or, vendors or suppliers cross border. Uh, that's the scenario that we're going to walk through. The key component when building this cross-border solution is understanding two factors and how you want this to be presented to the end customer. Because what you really care is about the end customer's journey and how they're going to interact with you and how that money is actually going to move. So the UX component is huge, right? What sits on top, or on, I guess I should say under that UX component is the flow of funds. So how is that money actually going to move, right? And so that's what we can walk through here. So on the left-hand side, right, we have a US buyer that's based in you know, the US here. And they are a customer of this digital bank, right? And this US buyer needs to purchase goods or services essentially from this UK vendor. So how the heck are they going to make that happen? So within this digital banking platform or this experience, right, that corporation, they log into that beautiful app that they've created. They, that corp, let's say they get issued an invoice from that vendor for those goods or services that they want to purchase. 
Then they want to instruct essentially a British pound payment to that vendor based in the UK. In this flow here, that vendor gets that money in GBP and then eventually you know, provides the goods or services. So pretty basic flow from that standpoint, right? Can I ask you a question? Sure. If you're going to go deeper into this, I won't ask that question. Yeah, no. We want to keep this open dialogue for sure. So number one, which payment rail are you using, right? Because yep. there's a lot of wires. Yep. We'll get into that here. What a magnificent yeah. segue to the next bit of animation. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it, man. Let's see that. Currency cloud givers. There you go. Yep. Well, in so, case you lose them. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. So with the banking partners that we're connected with or, you know, any cross-border payment provider, right, they're working with a liquidity provider. Um, so we have rails effectively to get that money in um, and USD through local banking partnerships. Where those funds are ultimately swept is to our liquidity provider where, you know, they, we have holding accounts where we can convert between those currencies, right? So... Yep. Because I'm assuming it's a shameless plug, JP Morgan liquidity pro provider, right? Yep, and we can talk into that too, just around how rates are presented and especially ways that you can build around that, right? And you know, to your point, some banks hold a rate, some some banks provide like a real time rate, for example. So um, part of that will go into a deeper discussion like on how you, you know, manage that liquidity and you know manage, you know, your FX risk as well. So, yep, going back to this, um, and then, yeah, again, feel free to, you know, stop us and ask questions. It's a workshop, so we want to keep it as collaborative as possible. Um, so going back to this use case, you know, this U.S. buyer, they, you know, uh, confirm that USD equivalent, um, and then, you know, that debit balance is created, um, and then they confirm the payment, and the payment is processed here. So what's going on under the hood, right? So this is the flow of funds, and this is where that gets detailed, right? So you have a US buyer, they have their corporate bank account here in the US. Somehow they need to get those funds to that vendor that's based into the UK and deposit those funds to that user's bank account, right? So through the rails to discuss on that, to get that money in, let's say to the currency cloud provider, environment or, you know, that liquidity provider's environment, right? So they can essentially instruct a Fed ACH payment or a Fed wire payment directly from their bank account. That posts at that currency cloud ledger or at that currency cloud account. And then currency cloud essentially manages uh, that FX or the foreign exchange. Essentially, the neobank is plugged into that provider's API or our API and provides you know, that foreign exchange service. Um, effectively. Are they making the payment uh, from a wallet in the currency cloud? Correct. Yep, yeah. so it would be a wallet effectively, right? So. Your master account or account would be held by one of the banks, right? So exactly. Yep, so they're essentially virtual accounts that sit on top of these providers, yep. Um, yep, so those funds are converted in GP. Um, and then ultimately, you know, those funds are dispersed using the in-country rails or the in-country local ACH scheme, right? Most providers have this offering, right? So where they can connect with local banks um, to, you know, to provide the ACH equivalent in that country. Um, what's nice too is, you know, most providers, if they, you are working with them from a cross-border perspective, have that connection into SWIFT as well to send, you know, essentially an international wire through those banking schemes. Just Jumping back very quickly to that one, though. So it's probably worthwhile just talking about because we said we're going to try and sell you, Scott. If you imagine for a second that Currency Cloud was just taken out of the equation, so we weren't there, what happens in that sense? You've got the, in that case, the US buyer's bank has got to have at least a direct or some sort of correspondent relationship with the receiver's bank. Now, that typically happened in the old world. Buyer, I think in the US, the terminology is international wire transfer. So if payment, 
the general consensus from certainly consumers and also small businesses is that that is prohibitively expensive. It's because you're relying on a third party, like I'm probably a correspondent neighbor, like say JP Morgan or from correspondent banking services. The idea there is, one, it's, it's, it's expensive, um, it's clunky, and also the final amount that actually arrives with the, the recipient, the beneficiary of the money, often doesn't know how much it should be because there's been an FX transaction that's happened somewhere within the banking world, and then there's often correspondent banking fees as well. So money is deducted from the principal sum as it passes through the correspondent network. What's useful here is that with Currency Cloud, um, we're utilising both the domestic scheme for the receipt of funds and then the domestic schemes for the outbound pushing of money. So we receive money within the US via Fed trans trans transaction. We push money via the UK faster payments. And our secret sauce here is effectively is trying to um, abstract or, 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 or mitigate the complexity of a traditional correspondent network. Because what happens in here is the money is being received in, with one of our banking partners in the US and then the money's been pushed out here by one of our banking partners in the UK and it's the internal bit that actually moves the money across the pond and converts it from dollars into sterling is just our treasury system happening behind the scenes. So we can do clever things like net stuff off. Now typically speaking, that's an awful lot harder for organised cities to do unless they have the economies of scale, unless they have the transactions in place. So to do it yourself and again use what we talked about, the first approach, build it all from the ground up, it's going to take you an awful long time and you probably won't have the flows there to justify doing it for what's potentially a number of years, which is why we're again advocating buying the specialty expertise from your partners. Absolutely. Yep. I'm going to ask the, the, the SWIFT charges for US, I mean, I, in the UK it can be anything from £15 to probably about 50 quid. So what's that? But is that for the US, is that comparable? I'd be keen to know. Yeah, like 25 on average, I think, for average user. 25 bucks? Yeah. That's right. If that's if you have, like, if you're connected to a data infrastructure, if you're going to, like, a bank or a data bank, 50 bucks is, yeah. is what you're going to pay sometimes. So. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're sending a, little, a low value payment, that's really not very cost effective. Yeah, I just didn't pay much money to ask it to the US yeah. So the, the cost of the, the actually sending the money was 50 quid? Yeah, it's a percentage and then it caps out. Yeah, okay, okay. So that's what, imagine if you're trying to send someone like, you know, $50 then. So you send, it costs you $50 to send $50 I mean, it's with a percentage value. Right? But what's, so the, the, the transparency of using this uh, by the local rails is, is much more cost effective. I mean, the, the Fed wire transaction, I, I think for consumers, is it pretty much free or is it? Very cheap. Very cheap. Yeah. And likewise, the outbound pushing of payments via the fast payment network. Again, the big banks have maybe a two, three, four, five pence. If actually, and for consumers, that's buried within the cost. So, I, the, in me using uh, a UK bank, I cost me nothing to make a payment to my friend in the UK. Would you, uh, in this scenario, would you um, present the rate? Yes. Yep, and we'll dive into that in a bit. It's next um, slide, but yeah, it's, it's a good shout, really. The idea is um, one of the problems with the traditional way of doing it via the correspondent network is who does the FX? I think typically it's going to be on the bank receiving the money. They're expecting pounds sterling, they receive dollars, and they'll do it on a day rate and probably apply a 2 3 4% markup or charge on that, which the beneficiary, the receiver of the funds, is completely unaware of. They just see a sterling amount posted in their account. So there's no transparency, there's no way to reconcile that because you don't have advance warning of what's coming and for how much. So yes, all of that is, is crucial. Are you guys the yeah, so that's, again, it's taken a while. We've had to build a business for like 12 years, yeah. but trying to get the, the netting off of, and we don't net off everything, you know, so it's, it's like any sort of thing, but the idea is in doing that, the, the goal of our organization, and, and certainly in partnering with, well now Visa, which is our, our new dad, um, they, uh, having a treasury hub that actually can follow this on. So right now we were okay for a long time because London is the foreign exchange capital of the world. So we're okay. But after a while, having that in-country liquidity is so crucial. So starting it in London, passing it to our, our New York um, desk and then picking it up when the sun comes around in Singapore. So make sure we've got that seamless 24 hour rate is, is so crucial. And the back, this is my first. Um, you, I would love to have more of them. So right now, um, we do have a number of, of, of market maker banks, and we connect to them via the, the fixed connection. 
So we then consume all these various rates from these different liquidity market makers, if you will. So the names are quite good. The, the main FX providers in the UK, certainly, because we're a, a UK first, but that's where we started, but we're branching out. So guys like Barclays, guys like Deutsche, guys like Citibank, they're typically the ones who, who are more comfortable offering FX. Yeah, and to address that too, so to your point, like somebody in more than likely a use case with that fixed connection, it is sometimes just a trader behind the desk and then you know we consume that data that they push to us. So, yep. And so we can talk about that too. Various liquidity providers do provide like a wholesale real time rate, right? Or you know they provide like a static rate where they're holding that for a specific day. They're adding their own like what you call a markup or like a spread to that effectively. Mm -hmm. cool. cool. Any other questions? Coleman, last time. Awesome. You want this one? Yeah, go for it. Cool. I got it. Yeah. Yeah, so point. yeah, so we talked about. It. So bear in mind that we, we first set out right. We we are we're fanatic about being customer centric. You know, the idea is the customer's king. You want to make sure that they've got that best user experience because that's what's going to determine the success of your product. Again, we've also talked about the fact that we need to be realistic. I can't just make money move from one account to another and just like by waving a magic wand. It's got to flow through at least some sort of financial channels. So that brings everyone back down to earth with a bit of a bump. Because again, that's often where the compliance element comes in as well, which can, can make things more complex or make things more, more defined and more restricted than just having complete carte blanche to design any old sort of payment flow. Under that is our API. So the API is, is built very much as the most malleable part of this process. If you've got a really rigid or really specific vision for your user experience, that comes first, flow of funds second. Underneath that is our API, which can be, can be assembled in a modular fashion. Now, we talk about the four different API components to create a cross-border transaction. We've got them listed here. The one is actually creating an FX conversion. As you're, you pointed out, there's actually two underlying API calls that exist within that. One is obtaining that indicative rate. So you're basically using an API instruction to, to ask what would be the technical equivalent of saying, what would my rate have been had I booked a trade at this time? So you're, we quote and execute against a live market and all day and all day. And I think why that's really important is certainly some of the more legacy or incumbent banks and, and providers out there often offer a static, maybe like they'll hold a rate for uh, an hour or four hours or half a day or even a full day or sometimes multiple days in a row, depending on the type of provider and the type of currency. Now, what's happening behind the scenes, however, is the FX market is moving up and down all the time. So to offer that static rate, the provider of the liquidity is having to build in some buffer. They're having to manage the risk. They're having to put some padding on that rate. And sometimes that padding can be quite excessive. And as, as users, we don't actually know because, say, the FX market, I mean, who, who checks what the rate is before they're trying to make a payment to their friend overseas? It's very unlikely. So that's why it's important to make sure that we're being as transparent as possible and presenting via API calls. So then a financial services, a neobank, for example, could then represent that back to the customer and create that audit trail so they know they're getting good, good value for money. Creating the payee, the beneficiary, um, this is where it gets definitely more compliance focused. Um, you can imagine you try and create a payee to a Osama Bin Laden family trust, then people are going to have a sense of email failure. So what you want to do is make sure you, almost, you build in the processes in-house so you can prevent the, the beneficiary even being created if you know it's falling within like a dodgy watch list or they're on some sort of sanctions or whatnot. And again, we've seen what happens because with the, the invasion of the, the, the war in Ukraine, we've seen that you know, people got put on the sanctions list really, really quickly. And you had to have your sanctions list updated almost real time. Because if you're suddenly making payments to someone who's, who's not, not legit, then you're in an awful lot of trouble. So, so you, the, the API essentially makes the payment to be linked counterparty. Uh, you, you, can, you can do everything sort of in line and then submit it. You have to first you know, put your counterparty in. Yeah. yeah. Some sort of ID so yeah, there's, there's a few different ways to cut it, but you're absolutely so we, we if you imagine a beneficiary for a second, it's a bank account, but it's an object in our system. So the idea is that we'll create this beneficiary and that's gonna have your your payload of information. So if it's a individual or business, a first name, last name, registered address and whatnot. And then once that information's been taken, we actually have an external provider ourselves, which we call out to to say, is this person a sanctions list? Is there a, a false positive or whatnot? I, 
I th I so from a transaction monitoring perspective, it's actually just on the sent payment effectively. So that'll go through our systems there. Now we do val validation, right? So that obviously that's separate to any sort of um, you know sanction screening or transaction monitoring. But we will you know obviously work with another provider to validate the information that has been entered is correct. Yep. No. So this nope. is one of the beautiful worlds of compliance is that. If I'm a sending bank, generally speaking, I will have to know the, the origin of the money and the destination of the funds. And I will use other financial organizations to move that money along the chain. Each other organization has that same obligation. So you're almost doing, if I'm doing from sender to currency cloud to beneficiary bank, all three of us will be doing the same compliance checks on that transaction. Um, it's the idea that you can you can maybe outsource the, the work, but you can outsource the risk of the responsibility. So everyone just does everything because, as I say, the, the, um, the damages, the, 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 the reputational, but also the monetary damages for actually getting caught being in breach of compliance, that shuts down businesses. Yeah, 100%. So this, I think this is, this is a good actual segue. So when we talk about this a little bit and we'll go into the underlying uh, I'll well, we'll get into that soon. But yes, the idea is that if you imagine, again, building it all yourself as well, and you've maybe got the vast majority of your flows is between the, I know, the UK and the, or the Eurozone and the US, and that's like your primary corridors, but you've got a small subset of customers making make payments to the Philippines, as like remittance, call, remittance payment home. Suddenly to have the agent that's done in country, the complexities of having a restricted currency that the FX has done onshore, all these things certainly get much more complex. And, and having one single API endpoint that based on the logic behind the scenes can determine what information has to be captured and when, that's really quite powerful. Um, and then push notifications. Let's be honest, sending the payment is one thing, but the main complaint, the main customer feedback we always get is it's never cost of how much it costs to send the money. It's never the FX rate. It's how fast is the payment actually delivered to the, the customer and do I know the money has actually arrived so I can start demanding my goods and services. This is consistently the main, the main feedback we get. We want better ways to move the money faster, and we will be, have absolute certainty that the right amount has run into the right bank account in the right time. Do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, so really, when you're creating that FX conversion, what's happening under the hood, right? So there's a lot of components that go into it. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, right, some banking partners can provide a static rate or, or a hold-in rate, right? Um, and really when you're doing this is how do you manage that? How do you manage those expectations for the user? Um, you know, some providers, they provide a real-time rate, so how do you manage that risk with rates constantly fluctuating with the market? Um, so th those are all considerations when you're building that into your UI or your, in your product. Um, and in our case, right, we're providing those real-time exchange rates. So when you pull that quote, it's just an indicative price. Um, it's what we're getting from our provider and passing on to our customer. Um, and then, you know, really it's up to them. We're giving them the, tool, the tools to manage that. So some customers in this space, just as an example, if you are dealing with those real-time quotes, they build out a beautiful experience where, um, you know, that user can log into the app. They type in the currencies that they want to, you know, buy and sell. You know, they type in the various amounts and then they click a fancy button in the back end, you know, that's calling the API. That's pulling in essentially a, a rate um, that's provided from the API. Maybe that user experience also builds in some sort of timing mechanism, uh, like a countdown or a timer for that end user to confirm that they want to lock in that exchange rate. Again, that helps, um, you know, in our case, our customer manage their FX risk because they are dealing with that fluctuation. Um, and then, you know, once they execute on that, they're effectively locking in uh, that current rate for what was quoted to them. Um, and then, you know, as David mentioned earlier, so there's a lot of jargon or, or verbiage when you're trading currencies. So what some providers do is they can provide essentially like a spot rate. So meaning that, you know, that rate will effectively settle like T plus one or T plus two. Um, or, you know, some providers offer future trading capabilities so where you can hedge against your, your risk there. Um, what's kind of nice, too, is where Currency Cloud factors into that, and some providers offer that as well. Uh, you can book forward trades, so you can essentially...
quote your customer um, you know, a trade for that specific day and then execute on that trade in the future. So it locks in that rate, uh, you know, maybe 12 months into the future there. Yeah. I think we um, can probably skip past the create base. We talked off about the beneficiary management piece of that. So creating and utilizing, validating things like the IBAN. Creating the payment itself, that's when we're determining the rails that we're going to use. Are we going to use the international SWIFT network and use the existing correspondent banking network? Or are we going to try and use a, an in-country provider that's got access to the, the domestic real-time growth settlement system. So the idea, for example, UK, faster payments, Eurozone, et cetera. And again, what we've understood from that is that typically it massively reduces the overall cost and it mitigates the concept of having corresponding banking fees. So you know that the principal sum that gets sent is the money that's going to arrive and be received by your customer. G. Cool. Yeah, and so after you create that payment, it's important to know how those funds have reached that beneficiary, right? You want that transparency for the user. So uh, consuming, you know, a webhook um, where you can take that data that, you know, the payment's been released and, you know, you have that information that it's on its way to uh, the beneficiary. And what's nice about that is you can take that data and format it and, and build that in um, to, to that experience just to notify that user. So maybe you deliver that um, and an email to the user based off of that information that their funds have landed, um, all is hunky-dory there. So I mean, we, we, this is probably a good chance, right? So we're going we're gonna to jump to our dev center, and that's going to probably like bring it light a little bit. But it's a very important point. The idea is again that the, the, the crap that comes with making a payment, um, and understanding all the various like you know the, the MT 103s or whatnot, the understanding of that, it gets deeply technical to have that. So we've created, for example, it's the the URL is like it's create underscore payment, and then you pass in the pram. So you've got a international or we've got local dem local rails it's got the amount it's got whatnot so why don't graham you yep. nip across and we'll, we'll give you the the actual real world experience of how it all hangs together yeah great yeah so the first step in that process right is pulling that detailed rate in so now we can play with our apis and show what that experience could look like right um so yeah again this is just a git call right so you're just pulling in that detailed rate uh, that you would, you know, maybe expose in your application there. So keeping consistent with the use case in that sp specific scenario. I'm gonna log in here really quick. about that yep so speaking of that specific use case right let's say I want to pull in a quote for my end customer um, so again these are just parameters that you're setting within uh, this uh, call so that query call here let's say that I want to purchase some British pounds and sell some USD that I have in my wallet right so the funds have hit the currency cloud account now we're ready to execute and quote that rate to our customer here we're just fixing the sell side, so now I'm just saying I know how much USD I want to sell to purchase British, some British pounds here in my wallet. And since I'm acting on behalf of my customer here, I need to supply this information. 
But you're, yeah, you're always, you got fixed one size. Yeah. So you can either, you can sell a specific amount of US dollars and have the floating currencies GBP, or you can buy a specific amount of GBP and then the floating amount is going to be how many. So you're, the things that we can't control are the rate. Yeah. And that's going to be sourced from the market. What we can control is either a fixed purchase amount or a fixed um, sell amount. So great. Perfect. Go ahead and run this code here. And we get this lovely response, right? So what you're d seeing here in some of these response parameters is we're actually displaying three separate rates. And we can touch into that, right? Now, keep in mind, this is just an indicative quote. It's not, yeah. yeah. Yep, exactly. This is, we're not, you know, doing any real conversion here. But yep, so we, in this response, we're just presenting, you know, the buy and sell currencies, um, and then effectively the rates that are pulled in. So that core rate, the bottom rate, that's essentially the wholesale exchange rate that we're getting from our liquidity provider, right? The client rate is what you can actually present to the end customer, um, indicative of any market right there. And then that partner rate, that actually correlates to, or actually is the same as the, the core rate. So that's what we're passing on to our customer, right? So they're getting that competitive wholesale exchange rate. So again, you can take this data, format it, and you know, build that into your UI experience. Um, most of our customers will, you know, again, just display the currencies that are being bought and sold, uh, the various amounts, and then that single rate that they've quoted to the end customer. So let's say now I want to, I'm happy with this quote. I want to actually lock in that exchange rate and convert that currency. So I'm just going to do this from right here. So I'm going to make a post call to our create conversion endpoint to lock in that specific exchange rate. And again, as you discussed, you can build in that sort of timer or that mechanism uh, to really help with that uh, you know, risk management of the FX. passing around API keys freely, so. <laughs> Apologize about the te technical difficulties here. Right, so I want to buy some British pounds. I want to sell that USD. I'm going to sell $1,000 worth of USD. And I'm going to execute on that. The nice thing, and so again, this goes back into that aspect where you can specify when you want this trade to execute or when you want that trade to settle. So that's where some of these parameters can come in. So you can set that to earliest, so that will settle at the you know, earliest settlement date possible, or you can set it out into the future. And so that's, you know, depending on the foreign exchange product that you want to offer, uh, that can come into play here. Let's just say I want to have this settle as early as possible because I want to make that payment as quickly as I can. So then we get this nice response that the conversion is executed. Um, again, you know, this can do, be displayed in that user experience where you show them effectively that customer when that conversion is going to settle on that settlement date. And effectively, um, it's a nice receipt that you can display in that user experience as well of um, how much currency that they bought and sold. Perfect. Yes, question? Uh, where would the currency cloud user, not the end user, be able to monetize and add spread? Yeah, it's a good, yeah. It's a good question. So when we, some people take it and manage that, applying their own markup, their own margin, and their own, their own systems. 
but we can have the offer to do it here. So if you imagine here the Graham alluded to, so you've got the core rate, which I've just lost somewhere, which is the rate that we get from our provider. We then get the partner rate, which is the rate, if you imagine we're a B to B to X organization, so the rate that we give to the business that sits in between. And then you get the client rate, which is basically predicated on they have a, a way to apply a markup, either in basis points or in percentages, which ensures that they're actually monetizing that part of the transaction and build themselves a new revenue stream as well. So. Hundred percent. So yeah, it's, it's yep. Yep. You you can or you can't do it in the moment. So you can you can either st stipulate a, a client buy or sell amount on top of the transaction. So you know the indicative rate. You can figure out that, or indeed you can just have a, a pre-existing uh, we call them a spread table in our world. The idea being that you just apply that to an account setting, and then whatever the prevailing exchange rate is, it gets a twenty basis point markup. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, the, the fundamental concept here is that with, with Currency Cloud, we've, we've, we've compartmentalized it. We've broken up the transaction into bite-sized chunks, and we've put FX in its own little bucket over here because it's complicated, complicated enough while trying to put a payment on as well. So in that, what we've done underlying system is predicated on a series of, of, of balances, so credits and debits. So the idea here is the FX transaction. You imagine when you post funds in to your balance, you have a credit of USD. You create an FX conversion. You have a debit of dollars, and you have a credit in GDP and then you have uh, a payment out to the UK supplier or the UK beneficiary, which again is going to have a GBP debit on the underlying balance, so everything nets out to zero. That's good. Cool. Yep, so with that in mind, right, now we can actually make that payment out of that wallet. So we're assuming that that British Pounds is now available. Now we can set up that pay and essentially instruct that payment to that beneficiary that's in the UK. You're getting this in real time. Yeah, so yep. we've, got, we've got a handful of liquidity providers that sit behind this call. Um, and again, as you imagine, the, the robustness of, of our platform is having more and more providers that can give that reassurance. So if one is not available, then we can have it. And that level of resilience is, is quite powerful, especially for, for fintechs. If they, they put all their eggs into one banking partner and it falls over, then they're screwed. The other thing that also allows us to do this is we've built certain capabilities where we can take a transaction, not necessarily lay off in the market instantaneously. So that means that, for example, we can offer an FX rate over the weekend. So we'll basically cash a rate, hold it, and then represent it to the customer. Because the FX market only works Monday to Friday, but you've got a lot of your end customers who are going to be using their international transit capabilities on Saturday and Sunday when they're traveling. Did you ever so go to like broker like eToro or something like that? Like no, no. So we're, we're, to be honest with you, that's, um, I, I can say this now because it's public, but eToro is actually a customer of ours. So we're the other way around. We typically, we've got a general principle that you, as an organization, we want to go as close to the FX, like primary market as we can. So we're looking for the market makers or the tier one banks who can give us the best rates. Yep. Say again? I'm going to take your headphones back over. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing shady about the city of London. No, that's absolutely not. Um, go on, I'm just keeping over time, Graham, so if we want to keep this moving, that's Yep, no. yep. I'll just run through this. Um, so yeah, we'll create, this we'll create this beneficiary and send this payment now, right? So um, we're just sending some British pounds here to some guy named Joe Schmo. Um, so that's what we've set up here. Obviously, we've specified the country that we're delivering this to and all the fun parameters, right? And then again, yeah, as, as mentioned, what's going behind the scenes is we're doing some validation against this. We're using another provider to confirm that all this information is actually correct, um, avoids bat fingering, uh, that nature, right? So I make this request, and then I get this lovely response, right? And the nice thing, or the neat thing is, is that this beneficiary then is automatically already added to the you know, Currency Cloud account library, and you can you know, draw down and pull uh, that information back again, so you can make a payment to that existing beneficiary. Sure. Yep. So you put in you put in that ID from your quote into into this. You can link the payment and the conversion together. Yep. Converted the pounds, so I want to make payment based on that quote, based on that ID that represents that quote. 
Yeah, so we, we, we think we have ability to, to link the conversion to the payment or the payment to the conversion. I forget which way around it is now. Um, yep. But yes, the idea is you can, so you can tag and you've got a degree of the audit trail that can hang the transaction together. What's ironic enough is that a lot of our customers don't yep. actually use that. They just want to have dollars and then they'll make payments and we'll stable the currency for them, but then they'll just erode that balance as the payment, the payment requirements come in. Yep, exactly. Yep. Yeah, I think Graham alluded to that. So yeah, absolutely right. So that's actually quite useful, certainly for people who are trying to manage the budgets, um, sell USD and buy euros if the rates are a favourable rate, or indeed you want to protect yourself from the market falling off any further. Um, certainly when you've got like invoice payments, so 30 days, 60 days, 90 day payment terms, you buy your FX for and you lock in the rate for a, a month out or two months out or whatnot, or even you can just, you know you've got X million exposure over the next six to 12 months, you can book that in at a rate that's favourable and then utilise that on a case-by-case on a -case basis. Yep. And now that we've created that beneficiary, we can execute a payment against it. So that's what we're demonstrating here. Again, I'm just filling in that parameters. So when you call that beneficiary call or that payee call, what we return back, obviously, is that unique identifier. Um, that's essentially what you're submitting in this additional API call to make a payment against that object, right? That's just the UI. Exactly. Yep. blank response here, um, but you get the idea. So in that response payload, again, we would confirm that receipt. There'd be information on you know, when that payment would settle. Um, and then the nice bit about that, so the push notification or that webhook, uh, these are the series of events, right, that once you've initiated that payment, this is the, what that payment will go through, right? So it'll be in that pending status or ready to send. We would send out that payload. Once we release that payment, we're, we're processing it through our bank partner. Um, and then finally, we deliver that completed message, meaning that payment has left the ecosystem out to the beneficiary bank, right? Um, and then, you know, we're calling out some unhappy paths, right? So if that payment fails for whatever reason, we'll deliver that with a failure message. Or, you know, if we fail it for compliance reasons, if it hits, you know, a sanctions check, uh, that would come in and we would, you know, indicate why. How do you guys standardize Exactly. Yep. Um, it's the latter, right? So it's just that enumeration bit that we've built into the platform. Not a lot of error codes. Yep. Yeah, and it's it quite. Yeah, to that point, right? So with Japanese yen, there's no concept of fractions, right? So, and we would return effectively an error when you, you know, try to execute with a Japanese yen payment. Yeah, it'll say like no decimals or something like that. Yeah, yep, exactly. Great. So yeah, that's essentially the process flow or really how you build it. So the API is behind the scene and what you would call there with that specific scenario. Cool. So look, um, appreciate the time. So we'll, 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 we'll try and rock to this a little bit quicker. But this is the, the sort of like the same sort of scenario. It's been reverse. Um, and this is imagine much more of an accounts payable or accounts receivable solution. The idea that you are a US, there's a, you're, a, you're a seller, but you're actually providing a service to to an overseas customer, but that overseas customer, maybe they're the bigger one, they're the one that you're trying to satisfy, they're the one that you're trying to please. So you want to have the ability to send them an invoice in their own domestic currency. So in this case, we've given ourselves French buyer, you're making a purchase from a US seller, and then this is the way it's gonna work out. So again, they're making that, that the agreement to buy those goods or services, it's gonna be priced in euros, but you guys as the, the US provider, you want to ultimately receive the funds in USD. So how does that have to get in? So you issue the, dollar, the, the invoice in euros, they pay for the goods in euros. It's very much the UX is actually focusing on not necessarily your customer, but the customer's customer. So the idea here is that you're given the ability to settle that funds in USD. We're actually giving 
the, the American buyer, or say the US belly here, a capability to have a virtual European bank account, if you will. So the money gets to pulled into there. And again, if you look at the flow of funds perspective, separate credit transfer comes in, it hits currency clouds, and then we make that Federal research payment out. So again, we're utilizing domestic rails at every step. And when money is actually being moved by the SWIFT network, by the international banking services, it's actually happening within our treasury system. So it's, it's a much more optimized and effective way of doing business. And here, from the flow of funds, the Euro funds get held in the French bank, paid into a Euro I band that gets provided by Currency Cloud, but we can give that named account to the corporate and the, the US corporate, if you will. That money gets received in. They elect when to actually make the FX transaction. So not relying on the bank to just exchange it at their own time, their own rate. And then, oh, beg your pardon. We've got the treasury sweep of funds to the US, that's happening within Currency Cloud, and then final disbursement of funds. So we're sending the USD from our U US banking provider to the beneficiary, which in this case, your customer. Making sense? Cool. Again, once again, how to build it. Similar, flat, similar framework that we talked about previously. First and foremost, we've been fanatic about the customer experience and what it's going to look like. Flow of funds come second. But last but not least, we have the APIs. And what that means is, say, there's, there's some here that's going to be repetitive, so things like create a conversion and create a payment, get notifications. But the bit here is actually having to create account and again getting the IBAN. So this means it's actually creating a, a virtual balance within our platform that then has a ability to hold and receive euros, dollars, Japanese yen, Swiss franc, whatever it may be. But what we have to do is then apply payment credentials to those underlying balances. So in this sort of situation, we have underneath these two API calls, got in-region banking relationships to, to, to create that and basically sit our, our, our infrastructure on top of. So this case is say a, a euro IBAN. Then we've also got the actual infrastructure to create that, the ability to receive that money. We're doing the checks on the inbound funds. So again, receiving a payment from a Sam Bin Laden family trust, equally unpopular. So we're making sure that the money that's hitting our account is going to be in good, good standing. And then also just actually having the ability to then manage the sweep of funds back to North America so it can be fun. It's all happening within our, our, our special pool. Then given the fact that we've already spoken about notifications, I think we can probably skip through this unless anyone wants to repeat that. Traditionally, it's T plus yep. two. So we've, we've got the concept of, of obviously booking a conversion for depending on cutoff times. We can do same day, next day, spot, or spot forward. Um, that's from the FX piece, and then from the payment piece again, there are certain payment times. So if I try and release funds at five o'clock on a Friday night, it's not going to actually land necessarily until Monday morning. Now, what we're doing behind the scenes is again, why does that exist? That's because of the nature of the FX market and how it's always existed. But if we can extract that complexity away, we can make it a much more intuitive user experience. So I just, I sell currency. The fact that it's settling on spot somewhere over here behind the scenes, the customer doesn't care about. They just want to see the debit and the credit on their balance. And we're getting to that point where we're getting much more real time. So even though the fact that we're, we're not carrying any risk because we've booked the trade off, we've laid, off, laid the trade off in the market, what we're doing is making it much more easy for the customer to consume. Because when you start talking about spot and forwards with a man or woman in the street, what are you talking about? I've sold money, I just want the money. Um, and yeah, the payments as well, it's equally challenging. The, the big thing that we're working on extensively at the moment is, look, I can't make the SWIFT network go any quicker. That's, if I had that kind of power, you know, the cure for cancer would be ice cream. But when it comes to um, making our local payments, is working with in-country providers, is putting things like um, a, a flow of cash with those domestic in-region providers so we can instruct a much more instantaneous payout from them. That's, that's where we can shave time off the delivery of funds. Is that me? Yeah. So again, we've talked about this. We'll maybe jump back into the dev center here and we'll just very quickly show you the, the account creation and then pull in the IBAN. And then after that, I think we'll probably have given you guys a good hour of FX. So if you want to jump into yep. that. Absolutely. Yep, so again, just you know, behind the scenes, this is the process of how to build that solution, right? So creating that virtual bank account, pulling down the funding instructions. Again, we won't go.